place. There you go. Um, so please, please, um, if you don't want uh, your face on on the recording, uh, choose your your video now. And please, uh, can everyone mute themselves during during the talks? Um, we'll have a Q and A session after the the four speakers. Um, and so I think I'll given the time. I'll we'll kick off with uh, the first speaker, who is. Uh, Joanne Russell, well known to many of us. She's a researcher at the Biogenetics Group here at the James Hutton um, and graduated from the University of Edinburgh a while ago with a degree <laughs> in agricultural botany, then worked in Cornell University before, um, before returning to the UK to work at the uh, what was the Scottish Crop um, Research Institute, which is now the James Hutton. So she's been working on a range of species on diversity, but particularly in um, Bali, and for which you'll give a, a brief talk on just now. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Please share my screen. Um, how's that? Can you see that, Luke? Yeah. I can see that. Brilliant. Can everybody else see it? Yeah, I assume so. <laughs> okay, thanks, Luke. Um, so I'm going to start this um, whole seminar uh, section um, talking about heritage barley. And I've kind of put this big grand title of a valuable resource for the future breeding and sustainability in a changing climate. And it does sound like a bit of a mouthful for barley, but um, hopefully by the end of this and by the end of the other talks, you'll see that there's there's um, that this this resource that we have is extremely valuable. And I think in some ways will be um, uh, people will start to use this in the future. Um, this first picture, I've, I've tried to get lots of nice pictures. So if you, you can see the places that we've been that we grow these heritage barleys on. And this is me hand harvesting um, on Orkney um, some bear barley. And there's a lot of people involved in this work that I'm going to describe from um, from the James Hutton, but also our colleagues in, um, on Orkney and colleagues at the University of Denmark. So. Oh, no, it's not going to move. Uh, Joanne, maybe Hi. try using your keys. Uh, just like that be donkey. Yeah, maybe. Or the oh, hang on. How's that? Nope. Oh, that's really not a good start. Why don't you try stop sharing and then resharing your screen? Okay. Stop. Right. How's that? There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so, I, I guess the first thing to describe is really what is a heritage variety and uh, there's lots of various different definitions and I guess there's, you know, there's a kind of classic definition, um, but I, I found this definition um, and I thought these were, these were really probably really good ways to describe what a heritage variety is. So it's too new to be considered an ancient grain. So in some ways it's not really a land race that's um, been adapted from um, from the wild, but it's 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 still um, it's still too old to be a modern variety. So it's not like our elite lines that you see growing around about. And um, I like this statement. Again, depending on what age you are, um, you're, we, some of us, it may be not be our great great grandparents, but maybe just our great grandparents. But these would have been the varieties which our great great grandparents would have planted. Um, and they have benefited from centuries of selective breeding, um, but they aren't quite up to snuff in comparison to modern varieties. And as you can see here, here's a picture of Luke and Robbie or with their horses. And then there's that's me, and I'm not sure who that is. That might be Luke in the background harvesting. So um, we're maybe not that that old, but you get the idea of what a heritage variety is and what it's actually been used and how that's very different from a modern um, variety and how it's had very little inputs in terms of um, fertilizer or um, 
or any other kind of inputs. So, um, what's the importance of these heritage collections? And there's several, well, there's two main important things. And um, I put this slide in, I, did, I gave this talk years ago, and I found this quote from Chris, and I thought it'd be quite nice to put it back in. And according to Chris, the revival of ancient barley varieties thrills fans of old beer styles. So there's, um, you heard a talk maybe some middle of last year about Maris Otter and also Golden Promise. And some of these are, would be considered um, heritage varieties. And there obviously is a big market for craft brewing and craft distilling. Um, but more on, on a more a sort of, um, from our perspective, from a genetic perspective, we're much more interested in these as an untapped genetic resource. I mean, these these, these cultivars or, or these heritage varieties or what we sometimes are termed land races, which are locally adapted cultivars, that are a rich, rich reservoir of really interesting genes, genes that have um, evolved over tens of thousands of years since domestication and have allowed the barley plant to adapt to a wide range of harsh and natural um, and very different marginal soils. And again, this is another nice picture of some of the plots on Orkney. Um, and again, I'll show you some more of these as we go through the talk. So um, what we did was we decided maybe about uh, seven or eight years ago to assemble a collection of these heritage lines. And we have around about 150 accessions. And you can see here we have two row types and we have six row types. Um, they're mainly from um, Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales. And we have around about 50 that are from Scandinavia, from Norway, Denmark and Sweden. And many of these lines really originated, were originally collected um, at the Scottish Plant Breeding Station. Um, which was originally SCRI, which is now GHI. And in the in, um, when they were collected, we had these little sheets. I'm not sure if you can see these these data sheets that that described what these what this material was like. So we decided that we would actually multiply this material up. And at the time, we had some colleagues on um, at the University of Highland Islands on the at the Agronomy Institute in Kirkwall. And um, we decided we would try growing these and see how well they grew in Orkney. And at the same time, we would do a nice field trial down in Dundee. So we did a multi-site field trial over two years with two reps. And um, if you look at, you can see, you can see already just looking at that picture in Orkney, and this is at Kirkwall in front of the college, you can see the diversity, the, the variation in phenotype. And again, when you look at the Dundee plots, we see the similar type of diversity. You don't see the sunshine so much down in the Dundee plots, although the, the Orkney plots are very nice and sunny. But the interesting thing, and what kind of got us interested in this population was if you look at the graph below, and this is days to, days to what we call days to heading, but basically it's flowering and it's how quickly the plant actually gets to produce a product in this, in this case, grain. And you can see that down here, this is the early part at this part of the graph where the bear, the bear and Scandic land races are. And as you move up the two row land races and the elite lines are much later. So they have a much longer growing season. So for some climates, it might be better to actually have the grain produced much quicker and much earlier. Um, for example, on the west coast of Scotland, you like to get the grain out of the ground before it starts to rain in August. Um, so you can see the benefits of this. So we were interested in this early flowering. And the difference between the, the bears and the land race is about 15 days in terms of flowering, which relates then to um, obviously harvest. So we, we started to focus really on the bears and started to um, get much more interested in these. But at the same time, we also wanted, because we're geneticists, we also wanted to look at, um, we also wanted to look at I don't know what that is. I also wanted to look at the the genetic diversity, and this is um this is us looking at all um, variation across a wide range of genes in the barley genome, and you don't need to worry about any of the details here. I've color coded all of the bears as red. I've color coded all of the non bears, the England, the Irish, um, and other Scottish land races blue, and the Scandinavian lines are pink. So you can see that the bears group together in a nice distinct group. And then when you tease this out even further and you start to look at where we got these bears from, so if you start to look at the different islands, um, if you look at the Shetland Isles and you look at Orkney and then the Western Isles, where these were collected from, you can see that they form very distinct genetic um, groups. So all of the green ones are more similar to each other, but different from the Shetlands and different again from the Western Isles. So again, we were intrigued by this and we thought, you know, there must be some reasons why that these have been on these islands for so long and have become adapted to that particular climate. 
no, it's still not going. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Oh, so, um, so I've put in a nice picture here that um, Ronya took when we were up in Orkney and over the summer. And again, you can see that this is the bears growing nicely um, in Kirkwall. And again, you see the lovely sunshine and the ferry coming in. Sorry, that's just a little aside. I should really get a job as a tourist guide for Orkney. So, the other thing we had that um, that Peter Martin and John Wisher, our colleagues at, on Orkney, um, had access to was they had a field which is off round about when you come off the ferry um, um, from from the mainland and you come over to St Margaret's Hope, you'll drive past this part, and this is um, this is Bury, and Bury is um, you can sort of see here that the that the actual soil is very sandy, it's very um, calcite calcareous sandy soil and obviously has a quite high pH and when we um when we had access to this we started growing some of the material down here just to see how well it did and what we observed was that the bare lines um they start they actually grew really well compared to the recommended list lines so Irina is a modern line um produced in the last five six years and um was KWS line and some of the other lines are also those yellowy lines are also um some of our recommended list lines and so again we started to think about this and started to do some um some proper science on this rather than just observing this and what we found was that this soil is particularly deficient in manganese and um, you can see in this top picture, you can see examples of what manganese deficiency looks like. And again, you can see here that the elite lines are very yellow and the um, bare lines are actually very, very green. And when we started to put some values to this, so we have a little a piece of equipment that measures what we call chlor chlorophyll fluorescence. And this measurement is very specific to measuring manganese deficiency. And if you look at the top graph, what you see is when we do this measure, you see that um, KWS Irina, Planet, and um, a Scandinavian recommended list line are all very low in the FBFM. So they're, they're not using um, manganese efficiently, they're very deficient in manganese. Whereas when you look at the bare samples, again, you see this much higher, almost um, completely efficient at using manganese. However, you do see differences amongst the bears. So there is there is differences between the bears. So we know there's a genetic component to understanding this. So at the same time, we thought, is, is this very specific to the bears or is this um, um, something completely different? And we wanted to make sure to check the yields. And so we looked at the grain yields. And again, if you compare our, the Dundee site, you can see that the elite lines do particularly well on Dundee, very high yields. Again, um, the bare lines do less well on Dundee, again, the black lines. But when you look at the red um, graph, you can see that those, the, the, the recommended list lines on, on the body soil are very poor and many of them didn't set seed at all. Whereas, um, and you look at the, the yield of the, um, of the bear on body, again, those are reasonably high yields and high, actually higher than you get on the good soils in Dundee. So we knew we had something here that was interesting and we knew that this is um, a really a really interesting trait and a very simple um, phenotypic uh, score um, way to score it. So we planted a much larger trial. Again, it's one of these things you don't actually believe it when until you actually see it yourself. So we planted in 2019, we planted a load of our recommended list varieties. We took all of the RLs and we also took a wide range of bears. And so what you can see here is an aerial view, and it's very simple to see that uh, most of the green um, lush plots are the bears, and most of the very yellow plots are actually the recommended list varieties. So we decided we would do, um, like all good geneticists, we thought we would actually cross these and see what was going on. So we crossed one, the Orkney bear uh, with a KWS Irina. And so the idea is that we would hope we get, we'd identify the genes that are important to tolerance, sorry, um, toler um, tolerant to nutrient deficient soils. Um, we'd also look for early flowering and then novel malting qualities. And again, I think as the talks go on this afternoon, you'll find out why these varieties, these um, particular heritage varieties are very good for malting quality. We crossed it with our elite line, in this case, KWS, which is high yielding, has very good quality and is uniform. So the idea would be that we would develop a population that we could unravel the, some of these things, but also potentially produce some new varieties or pre-breeding material that breeders could use. So we call Crossed these two, and again, so we've got the blue Irina with the Orkney bear, and we produced 
a, a cross which is a hybrid between the two, we then self-dose and produce what we call an F2. So you can see that this F2 has got lots of red, got lots of blue. And so what we produced was we wanted to then test this. This is the most diverse population you'll get in terms of genetics between two individuals. And we had 2,160 2, individual seeds. And we sowed each of these seeds out um, on the Burry site in Orkney. And we did this in 2018. And we did this by hand. Um, we gridded out each individual in families and then we labeled them all. And we started to score, um, Tim and Laurie scored the FBFM on these on a thousand of these plants um, down on their hands and knees. Um, our colleagues in, in Denmark, Sidsel, um, she actually took leaf samples from the same plants and did ICP analysis. Um, Ruth Hamilton and Alan Booth both went up and extracted, took samples for DNA again from the same thousand leaves. And then we went up at the very end of the summer and we harvested each individual plant separately along with the help of a cat. And again, we had a really nice day for that. You can see that the weather was a bit variable. I think Ruth got the worst deal because I think it just chucked it down a rain while they were harvesting for DNA. So based on all this, um, We've got our cross, we've got our thousands of individuals, and then we took these individuals and we did two things. One is we phenotyped them all, as we said, and you can see this is the distribution. This is a kind of funny plot, but basically what this shows you is the, each dot represents one of these individuals. So there's a thousand dots on this and it's the measure of FBFM. So it's the measure of which how much the um, how deficient they are in using um, manganese. So you can see that there's some that are very low and very obviously didn't grow particularly well. And then in around about here is the is the elite parent, and then up here is the um, bare parent. So you can see there's a wide range of distribution of individuals. Oops. Go back again. So we did that. At the same time, we extracted DNA. And we started to look at the genetics to try and identify regions and genes that are involved in this trait. And we have this region on 6H. Um, and so we know there's some genetic control for this trait. And we'll start to tease this out a bit more. But what else we did was we took each individual plant and their seeds and we went through a process of speed breeding. So basically, we take a seed, we grow it up. We grow up under intense light for about 22 hours each day. And in about um, six weeks, we have new seeds. We then take a single seed from that and we grow it again. And we keep doing that until we get a set of very fixed individuals that are genetically stable. And then we can start to actually really begin to understand what is controlling this particular trait. So this is where we are at the moment. We're at this stage of around about 430 fixed lines. And Unfortunately, during COVID, um, we actually grew, we sent the material up to Orkney um, to be sown. And so this is about 350 of those lines um, and we sowed them on Bury. Unfortunately, none of us could get up there to actually score them. And so we have these nice pictures of it, but we actually, the data um, was particularly unreliable, unfortunately. So we've not been able to repeat this experiment, um, but you can see um, how well it's, the changes are. If you look at this parent, this bottom picture down here, you'll see the blue arrows point to individuals that are obviously Irina-like, the elite parent-like, and then the red one where you get this nice green um, lush are more like the bare parent. So there's plenty of diversity in this population, and we now really just need to start to tease this out. Um, this is, again, you know, we, we are, every time we go to Bury, we have to take a picture of this phenotype just to make sure we're definitely seeing what we what we're expecting. And this was some field trials we had as part of a workshop. And again, you can see these these poor recommended list varieties, which are looking so sad compared to the bears, which are growing perfectly happy on this soil. So it, year after year after year, it, we're still seeing exactly the same phenotype. So. I just want to finish on that with maybe a couple of, um, you know, I guess kind of thoughts about, you know, what we can do with these types of work. So we really, these are unique combinations of diversity that are locally adapted. I mean, these are, you know, to, to lose these types of things would be, would be tragic. Um, 
but they also have the we have the we now have the ability in barley and um, to actually identify variation in almost every gene. So this is a perfect time to start beginning to look at this and start to use this information. And so hopefully we can start to tailor um, the, our breeding programs to specific environments, to um, changing environments, to variable climate, so that we can actually end up with um, with stability, which is one of the the key things that the, the certainly the monsters want is stable yields over year. Um, so this is a really good example of how we've how this adaptation on a marginal soil has allowed these genes to um, to to remain, and how we can start to actually use these under in in our breeding programs. And you know, a lot of people say, you know, we have all these gene banks, and we have all these um, you know all of these accessions saved up, and but if we don't actually use them then there's no point in conserving them. So for me, I, I like the idea of using them. And I don't really, I generally don't think that growing them just on their own um, is, is, is a nice thing to do. But at the same time, I think for breeders and for the future, we actually need to start teasing out what makes them grow well under these, uh, these conditions. And of course, they actually make great whiskey and beer and bannocks. And um, these are some examples of, um, this is the bear, the latest bear barley um, whiskey from Brucladi and um, Swanee Brewery also on Orkney use them. And then this one I think is from the Shetlands and some bannocks, of course. So just as way of thanks, um, this is, um, we did think we might get into the craft brewing industry and uh, well, we still might get into this. And I thought this would be a good, um, a good, label for us and this is this grumpy old man on Shetland who's one of the grow actually on Orkney who's one of the growers for Brucladi and um, we thought it would be a bear with a sore head and um, our craft room with Scottish attitude so thank you very much I'll stop there thanks Joanne um, just to let everyone know if, if everyone has questions can you please put them in the chat while people are talking um, and we'll just move on swiftly to the next talker who's uh who's also carrying on the theme of working in, in heritage bali uh susan flavin is an associate professor of history at trinity college in dublin and is working on an inter in interdisciplinary approaches to examining food culture and identity and as part of that she's going to talk to us about um recreating um beers from from the past thank Hi. you can you hear me, Luke? Just put your thumb up if you can hear it. Cool. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so uh, as part of that food called project in 2021, I was part of a team that recreated a beer last brewed in 16th century Ireland at Dublin Castle. And this was really sort of the idea was it was a practice based brewing project as a way of really drilling down to look in detail at one particular food stuff from a very deep interdisciplinary perspective. And we chose beer because beer was absolutely central to um, life in the 16th and 17th centuries. So like today, people drank um, to be sociable, but it was also really important for daily nutrition. So it was really as important, we're finding, if not more than bread in terms of what people spent on producing it. And it was like liquid calories, I guess, for work. So it was routinely provided. Um, by institutions like the army, um, religious institutions, castles, manors, and so on, as, as part of daily diet. And because it was produced so often, um, it left a really good record for historians to, to look at now. So we have a lot of detail about beer in this, in this period. And this one is from Dublin Castle in the, the um, late 16th century. And these can be really, really useful. So they tell us, for example, um, how much uh, people consumed. So at Dublin Castle is one example, you can see that the, the levels of consumption were astonishing. So in 1591, for example, the household drank over 241,000 pints of beer in a, in a given year. And we can work out roughly how much this is per person by looking at wage lists and looking at how many portions of food were served. And this was about six to 10 pints per person per day. And we're interested here in, in what household staff were drinking rather than and the elites at the at the castle. And this is about typical for Northern European consumption in this in this period. At other institutions, we're finding even higher levels of consumption um, linked to hard work. So at Christchurch Cathedral, it could be up to 15 pints of beer per day um, if, if labouring. Uh, and the accounts also tell us a lot about the nature of this beer as well. So unlike recipes, which are often used for historical recreations, 
these sh can show us the relative, am relative amounts of things like um, hops and malt that was used to produce specific volumes of beer at weekly intervals. So we can monitor um, how much relative malt was used um, over different times of the year and how much went into making, say, ordinary beers or strong beers um, and so on. So, in other words, the historical records are really very useful, but the problem is that because they are so rich, there's a temptation to push them to make assumptions that they just can't really support. So, to, to understand um, how drunk people got from drinking this beer or how nutritious the beer was, historians traditionally take very theoretical approaches. So, they'll use this sort of data and try and quantify um, how many calories were in a pint of beer, for example. And of course, this is extremely problematic because in these kinds of studies, brewing is only mentioned incidentally or theoretically, never engaged with in any, in any detail. And the problem with this is that um, conditions, technology, um, most importantly, ingredients in the context of today's um, seminar were really different in the past. And so the final product can really only be understood by trying to systematically reconstruct um, all of these processes using using period ingre ingredients, and this was not a small a small project. This took three years at least um, to implement um, for for a variety of reasons. COVID was was the least of our problems, I think, when we tried to when we tried to do this. Um, first, we had to identify a representative beer to to produce from from household accounts. Then we had to actually construct a brew house um, and all the equipment in in the brew house. And by identifying rather obscure pieces of equipment and then finding people with the skills, a really big problem to actually reproduce these. This was the copper that was hand built in Portugal um, because we couldn't find anyone with the skills to do this in the, in the UK or Ireland. Um, this is the mash vat and the, the filtration system that was, that was produced. Um, the woodwork was made by the last independent cooper in the UK who has since retired. Then we had to research and source appropriate ingredients. Um, the yeast um, was made from a, developed from a collaboration with microbiologists at University College Cork, and they resurrected a strain with genetic similarities to the ancestral microorganisms used in early brewing. Um, and then they came over to the museum at the Weald and Downland. Sorry, so I'm getting some kind of thing about annotation requests. So I'll just. And that has frozen my. Here we go. Yes, the microbiologists came to the museum um, and inoculated the beer at uh, the beer for us. And we also worked with hops experts at the Hops Association. And Peter Darby there um, helped us out with some with some hops. So in this case, we were trying to identify an ancestor for the earliest hops used in 16th century um, Britain and Ireland. And you can see from the account there that all we knew is that we needed a Flemish, um, a Flemish hop and a very early one. The best candidate for this was the Tallhurst hop, which you can see here. But there were so few surviving plants um, that it took us three years of harvest. So harvesting it each year, freezing it and keeping it for the next year, just to come up with three pounds of hops that we needed to make to make this beer. So I guess this just shows you again why it's important to keep, um, why, why we need to keep thinking about sustainability in this, in this regard. And then obviously, the most important ingredient, of course, was the was the malt. Um, and I'll say a little bit about why we why we worked with Orkney Bear as well, um, and why why that was um, what we did. And here we are on um, Orkney with John Wishart um, from the Agronomy Institute. Um, first, there are many references to bear in the Irish historical records. The earliest is an 11th century Gaelic Irish poem. Uh, closer to our period, it's mentioned as a distinct crop um, in 17th century poems, in things like proclamations that impose levies on various um, commodities. Um, we're also sure that this was the common choice for malting in Ireland, because in these household accounts that I've been showing you, barley malt is always referred to as, as bear. And this is also supported by things like descriptive sources. So in 1690, for example, an English officer observed that all Irish ale and beer as well as some cakes were made from from bear. Of course, we don't know exactly what that was, and the descriptions can be quite confusing. But we were certain that we needed to use a land race barley because research that exists 
um, shows that the characteristics that make these pre-hybridized varieties different also impact on their nutritional properties. So where there have been studies um, of the use of bear and brewing, land races have been shown to yield lower alcohol, um, perhaps because of the smaller grain size. And this has implications for our understanding of the properties of beers in the past, which haven't yet been taken into account by, by historians. Given that bear and all other land races had been lost from Irish cultivation as well, we were very fortunate that Peter Martin and John Wishart at the Agronomy Institute on Orkney agreed to collaborate with us as well and produce, um, provides with a small amount of bear for the project. Again, of course, um, although this is an ancient cereal, modern bear differs genetically from earlier counterparts. And as Joanne's been, been showing, um, it differs regionally as well. So what we have is not the same as what would have been used in 16th century Ireland, of course, but this still represents the most viable land race barley that can be used for the recreation of historic beer in any Northern European context at the, at the moment. Now, what I should note is that ha the, the beer that we produced required half bear and half oat malt. And despite huge efforts, even working with a farmer in Ireland to try and grow heritage oats, we couldn't make an oat that would um, produce viable malt. So we had to use modern oats with the bear to make to make the spear. But that's definitely something um, that we'd like to revisit in, in the future. Um, once we had the malt, uh, building a, a malt house was once we had the beer or the grain, building a malt house was outside the scope of, of this of this project. So Warminster's um, maltings made malt um, for us using traditional floor malting techniques. So again, this is quite close to what we would have had in the 16th century. And then all of our malt was querned um, using a quern stone by, by hand. And once everything was assembled, um, we then measured, mashed and fermented following descriptions of contemporary processes in accounts and in um, manuals and brew, brewing guides from, from the period as well. One principle throughout this was that we collected data at every stage using modern scientific equipment, but that was never allowed to guide the process. So this is very much following, everything was done by sight and um, following contemporary descriptions um, as well. And in the end, we successfully brewed. We had a few very unsuccessful <laughs> results from this as well, including one massive vat of porridge um, that no one likes to talk about anymore. Um, but in the end, we did successfully brew the Dublin Castle beer from 1574. Um, we produced around 75 gallons of, of beer in, in total. And then the end product was analysed by our um, collaborators at Nottingham University, um, the brewing scientists there who looked, that's the Dublin Castle beer there being, being tested by, by them. And this was the finished product in a nice 16th century cup. It was a, it's a kind of a hazy gold coloured, lightly bitter um, drink quite quite quaffable. You could drink quite a lot of it with, uh, with your dinner and, um, and and not notice it. I think, and the results are being published in the historical journal soon. So you'll get some some great detail there if you um, if if you want. Um, but just to give you some 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 of the results because I think these are an important step in pushing forward our understanding of um, early modern beer as, as food. So what you can see here are the ABV results from three, uh, the three completed Dublin Castle beers, which again is bear and, and oat malt. We did one beer that was just made with bear to see what the differences were, but it wasn't successful. So it's not really suitable for, for, um, for reporting on. But you can see there of the three that were successful, um, batch one was, was an outlier, recorded a much lower alcohol content than batches two and three. These ones provided ABV values very close to typical modern English cascales. And also their fermentation performance was very similar to modern ale fermentations. And in terms of um, the nutritional analysis, which we performed, and then we compared um, these to a modern um, international beer that's, that's consumed um, worldwide. So you can see the total calorie content from batches two and three was again, almost equivalent to modern lager at around 270 calories per, per pint. And again, batch one recorded a much lower um, figure. This, this is um, attributed to the reduced level of alcohol, which has the greatest contribution to calorie content of the nutrients that we measured. So despite then doing the same thing as we thought, or repeating the recipe and using the same processes, the brews did vary um, to different extents. 
batch one had a, a much reduced level of fermentable sugars probably due to the higher water temperature that was also the thing that caused us to have a big batch of porridge um, we, we discovered later that the first one um, was the, the batch one was the first one we brewed and as the team gained proficiency we started to learn um, how to deal with challenges as they as they arose this is probably um, the problem with with that but despite this variability, batches two and three showed really similar results, highly comparable to modern beverages. So we can say that by this point in the past, um, the key features of modern brewing were already in place. And our results confirm that beer, even made with land races and with period technology, was a fundamental source of energy in, in diets. So if we assume that our castle drinkers drank between five to 10 pints a day, this beer provided them with as many as 2,700 calories, which is very, very high. But crucially, it challenges results from more theoretical studies that have estimated up to 400 calories per, per pint. So again, this highlights really the blind spots that are created by monodisciplinary approaches, the practicalities of making food in the past using authentic ingredients and processes can really have a very significant bearing on the, on the final analysis. And the results also make clear that ordinary beer could be as potent as its um, present day counterpart. And for historians, this is an important step forward in terms of understanding intoxication um, in society in the past. So um, this is provided by employers every day for, for work. So the quantities of work, or the quantities of alcohol that workers are encouraged to drink um, had the potential to cause significant drunkenness. Um, in this in this period, and this helps us to understand, I suppose, why drinking to excess in other social contexts was often cast as so dangerous um, in this in this period by observers. But certainly, um, historians should be very wary of assuming that people in the past drank so much because the beer was weaker, which is the myth that we often that we often hear. Um, the story doesn't end doesn't end there. We documented the entire process by working with a film crew from Anglia Ruskin University, which adds another interdisciplinary dimension to, to all of this. And again, this is interesting because um, historians and scientists, I guess, don't tend to always think about the creative dimension to all of this. Um, the film crew as storytellers were looking at Bear in a very different way to how we, how we looked at it. They wanted to look at how it sounded, how it moved, um, how they could transmit that to audiences. Um, who might never get an opportunity to experience uh, experience it because it is really quite magical to stand in the field um, field of, of bear. But the idea is to think about making sort of scientific research and that more accessible to um, a wider audience. Um, and then in sum, I guess what, what we learned about beer and brewing does um, really improve our understanding of diets in, in the past. We couldn't have achieved this without access to heritage cereals, but also of course, um, dying craft skills, which also need to be um, sustained as well. Probably the main significance really for me anyway is the, is the interdisciplinarity. So I think this shows how a staple food can become a site for really radical collaborations across archaeology, history, science, and even the creative arts. And hopefully this will also lead to many new projects over time. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was fascinating. There's plenty of questions in the chat. If we could move, given the time, maybe we could move on to the third talk from Callum Holmes, who's Associate Professor of Brewing and Distilling at the International Centre of Brewing and Distilling ICBD at the Heriot Watt University. Callum graduated the University of Leeds uh, with a degree in microbiology and then moved went on to Nottingham for his PhD. And after working in the industry for a while, has moved back to Scotland and has uh, left the postdoc and then is now a, a associate professor at Harriet Watt. So, Callum, the floor is yours. Can you hear me okay? Just figuring out how to put my camera on. Apologies. Mm. Okay. Callum, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a, a button that says start video. I do not see that. <laughs> Let me just stop sharing, I think, because that's confusing me. There we go. Okay, can you see me now? 
Yep, we can see you. Lovely, right? So I'll share my screen again. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Okay. Can you see my slides? Okay. Lovely. Right, so I'll get started. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the really upcoming work that we're, we're doing on, on Heritage Bali. A project that I'm talking about only started uh, four weeks ago, so we've not got quite as many results as our, uh, as our previous speakers. Uh, but I will be able to share some of the background uh, background information that, uh, or background results that kind of led led into this um, into this project. I'm starting a timer because I uh, I overran in my practice this morning, so I need to keep an eye on that. Okay, so if you've not heard of us before, the ICBD, just a very quick introduction. Uh, we're the International Centre for Brewing and Distilling, based over in Edinburgh, Harriet Watt University. We set up formally in 1990, but actually Harriet Watt's got a, a quite an extensive uh, history with uh, with brewing and distilling. Uh, There's a, a course in industrial mycology in um, in the early 1900s, and we've really been involved with brewing and distilling since then. Uh, but the ICBD was formally set up due to the growing brewing and distilling industries at the time, and and the value that was seen in in a scientific education around uh, around these disciplines. So as it stands, we offer uh, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in brewing and distilling and malting, and barley form quite a large part of that. And we also have research projects sort of from grain to glass as well, to, to sort of coin the cliche. So moving on to what you actually want to hear about, which is about heritage barley. So I'm quite pleased that actually the uh, so jo Joanne and Susan have, have already listed off some of the points that I was going to highlight here as to why there's a, a, a drive for, for these types of, uh, of barley. But just to sort of reiterate, in, in the whisky industry in Scotland, as of September of last year, we have maybe about 150 active distilleries. That's growing each year. Uh, and that's a trend that we see globally as well. So in Japan, there are more distilleries than ever the US as well and, and throughout Europe. So it's really a, a global trend and interest in in distilled distilled spirits, but really whiskey as well. Uh, so in order to stay competitive in that kind of market, there are these key drivers for pr providing a, a distinctive brand and a distinctive product. So that feeds into these ideas of, of community and regional history. So Many of these types of barleys have a link to, uh, to, to certain areas, but also uh, barleys that maybe have a, a, a traditional link with brewing distilling as, as well, um, which, again, trying to resurrect to, to preserve that, that link to, to, to traditional processes. So we heard about earlier, there's um, potentially some sustainability benefits to, to some of these types of barley. And then also, uh, really, my main interest is around the impact of these barleys on product uh, quality and aroma and composition. So we're already seeing some commercial, uh, commercially successful examples of products made using these these types of barley, and and this is uh, this is growing year on year. So. Uh, just one note here is uh, what what is heritage barley as, as opposed to why heritage barley and we heard sort of some definitions already today. Uh, so for this project, we're really taking a broad view of heritage uh, to encompass sort of hybridized barleys, which maybe have, have fallen out of use as, as they've been superseded by, by sort of modern elite varieties, but also we're encompassing uh, land race populations in there as well. Uh, I've heard, even just in the last week, some conflicting views of what, what heritage really means. But I think it's really, it's still a little bit like the word craft. It doesn't, doesn't mean very much uh, if, we're, if we're being honest. Okay, so where is the aroma coming from in, in our malt and in our whiskey? So if we start with our barley, we're going... Uh, into the malting process and we have steeping and germination and a lot of the sensory properties of malt are produced during kilning and these are mainly heat driven. 
so the Maillard reaction, caramelization between sugars, in some cases pyrolysis, but that, that would be unusual in a kilned malt. In a roasted malt, certainly pyrolysis will lead to some of these more acrid aromas. Um, we get conversion of uh, products from germination. So a classic example there would be S-methylmethionine, which is going to be converted into dimethyl sulfide, which uh, for, for any lager drinkers might be familiar. Dimethyl sulfide tastes a little bit like cabbage or cooked corn, which doesn't sound very appetizing, but it is a, a key aroma in quite a lot of beers. And then volatilization as well. So we're not just generating volatile components. We're also flushing away uh, components as well. And we see these same kinds of processes continuing into the, the distilling process itself. So mashing is quite a hot process. We see Maillard reactions taking place there. Then moving into fermentation, we have yeast cell metabolism. Uh, whiskey fermentations aren't sterile. So we see uh, the activity of the, the microflora of the, the barley and malt as well, also volatilization there. Distillation, which is where it's probably the most conscious area of aroma development in distilling, because this is where we take our various cut points and our four shots and main cuts and feints. Also, we see more uh, Maillard reactions, caramelizations from any residual sugars, and then interactions with the copper of the, the still as well. And finally, into maturation, where uh, we see uh, a variety of different processes, interactions with the wood, evaporation, that's your, your angel share, which isn't just ethanol. There are also volatile components in there as well. And then all of that is leading to that, that lovely dram of, of whiskey after a, a number of years. But if we go all the way back through that process, actually the, the substrates for almost all of these processes at one stage or another are from our, from, from our barley and from our malt. So two examples here are the Maillard reaction, which I've talked about a little bit, which is heat driven, uh, but is initiated by the, the interaction of a sugar and an amino compound, an amino acid. Uh, likewise, yeast, Yeast are responsible for many key uh, aromas of, of whiskey, but they are not creating those aromas from, uh, from thin air. That's all from the, the, the media that they're growing on, the wort, full of sugars and amino acids. So it stands to reason if we're using different varieties of barley or um, barley grown under different conditions, then we're providing a different profile of, of, of the, these substrates for these reactions, which would lead to, to differing aromas. Apologies. There we go. So that's really leading into what the bulk of this project is going to be looking at, which is, well, what's the source of these differences in aroma? Uh, why does one uh, product uh, made from one variety of barley differ from that of, a, of another? Is there some unique characteristic to these types of barley, which is possible. Maybe there is a, a an aroma compound present there that's not present elsewhere. But actually, what's more likely to be the answer is we're just seeing differing proportions of uh, of these compositional features. So the, the graphs that you can see at the moment, um, they're from a, a another collaboration, actually, with the same distillery, with Holyrood Distillery, where we've been investigating roasted malts. Uh, and we've been looking at differing nitrogen levels of barley and the impact that that has on, on aroma development in roasted malts. We can see here two dimethyl pyrazine representing this broad group of pyrazines, generally showing this trend up as we provide more nitrogen, which kind of makes sense because pyrazines are nitrogen containing heterocycles. They're associated with sort of biscuity type aromas, that malty characteristic that you would associate with a malt whiskey. Uh, so we kind of see this trend up and likewise with furfural representing furans uh, these are oxygen containing heterocycles which again really common in malt uh, but we see a downwards trend so perhaps an indication here that uh, something as simple as nitrogen content can play a, a role in in aroma development just to stress uh, the lightly kiln sort of distilling malt which is green on uh, on on this graph uh, the levels are very, very low or non-existent for, for this specific pyrazine. Um, so this is perhaps a slightly more exaggerated 
form of what we might expect to happen in, in a, a more lightly kilned malt. I guess as a, a proof of concept, composition is, is playing a role here. Um, and then this also draws into the sort of conversation, the processing of the barley and how important is variety, which I guess is something we want to look at. So uh, firstly, nitrogen content in barley is not just related to variety, it's clearly related to how barley is grown and processed and fertilizer regimes and uh, the environmental conditions during grain filling. So which is more important, variety or, or, or the environment? And then also leading into the malting process, the impact of the malting regime. So can we emulate some of the aromas that we might get from barley X in barley Y by malting it slightly differently? So as malting progresses, we see modification from the proximal to the distal end of the grain. Potentially, if we halt that process a little bit early, we end up with some unmodified or undermodified material at the distal end of the grain. If we were to germinate that for a little bit less time, we would end up with more of this undermodified material. So we can vary the composition of the barley uh, on a process basis, as well as just selecting our, our varieties. So outside of aroma, or I guess related to aroma really, because it's all interlinked, the properties of the barley are also related to process efficiency as well. And almost all of the components that we would see in a, in a barley are playing a role. So the embryo and aurone layers are rich in lipids, which are necessary for a vigorous yeast cell fermentation. So again, playing into how yeast are behaving in fermentation. We have aspects of uh, converting our starch with mashing enzymes. Again, some varieties presenting a, a higher potential for enzyme production than others. The answer is definitely yes. Um, but also physical properties as well, like the husk. We use the husk as a microfilter uh, in a traditional loutering process. Uh, how resilient is that husk to staying attached to the grain throughout the malting process, but also um, to surviving milling? What are the properties of the husk? The husk also can potentially play a role in flavour as well, because it's got phenolic compounds that we would uh, perhaps find from a, from a, from a peated whisky uh, in very, very low levels, of, of course. But barley is really important for, for everything. And we've looked at some of these processing characteristics. Again, we're kind of encompassing heritage as being some of these earlier hybridised barleys, but also land race populations as well. There's lots of interest in land races for, for, for making whiskey. Some examples highlighted earlier. Uh, so we've looked at a, a, a number of, uh, of, of land race populations so far. We just shared some of the select results just to highlight the potential for some of these varieties, but also, also challenges as well. So in the, the bottom graph here, we can see our hot water extract, which is one of the key uh, values that a brewer or a distiller would use when they're applying their, their malt. The values here are a little bit low. The student that made these results uh, was also investigating malting regimes. So this isn't, isn't representative of, a, of an industry malting regime. But comparatively, uh, we can see... Can I use a pointer? Yeah. Comparatively, we can see uh, our controls here. So these LB, L4, 6 and 8, they were all laureate um, sort of modern varieties of barley. Uh, provided as a reference, and then samples 11 through to 60 here, they're all examples of our uh, uh, land race barleys, our heritage barleys that we were looking at in this, this circumstance. 25, just to note, is uh, an example of a, a bear barley from Orkney. Uh, so we can see here that actually, in terms of extract, they're lower than the reference, but they're not that much lower. These are, are showing sort of reasonably comparative uh, values of extract but perhaps that's not the whole story and if we look at our alpha amylase content up here you see the alpha amylase content is quite a lot lower so one thing that this student had, uh, had not had time to, to look at but we certainly want to, to to investigate is well what's the quality of that extract we've solubilized material we've extracted it into work how fermentable is it what's the sugar profile 
is it going to produce potable alcohol that can that can be distilled so i think there's challenges and unanswered questions but there's certainly potential for a lot of these varieties and then there are also some of the physical challenges as well we can see here a photograph of uh, of some of these grains where seem to be particularly prone to uh, to, to breaking of the grains and, and skinning as well so good good and bad things to, to report i guess and finally just to end on hopefully the, the project that will be taking place over the next six years uh, as i mentioned started uh, about four weeks ago so a phd project sponsored by holyrood distillery it's been really quite rewarding working with uh, holyrood because i think they they're an indication of the way the industry is going so working within these scotch whiskey regulations but still taking an innovative approach around raw material strategy and fermentation and wood strategy as well so this project is going to be looking at heritage and land race barleys uh, working all the way through from nano scale uh, malting sort of four or, or six grams at a time through to micro malting analysis and then eventually um, full scale trials in their in their stills and actually we've started some of these uh, these trials already um, we have uh, eight examples of heritage grain which have been mashed in 1.25 uh, ton uh, mashes at the distillery they're currently fermenting i actually saw the uh, the plumage archer uh, in the wash back on uh, on monday really interesting kind of reddish orange color to the wash which is quite unusual um they they are going to be distilled soon popped into casks and then sampled throughout the uh, throughout the six years so we should be able to get a really interesting view of volatile and aroma development uh, from uh, from grain to glass okay uh, and then that's me so just to quickly acknowledge the work of Rutel, Marchiulianiti and Gerard Lozano Aguilar um, who provided some of the background results that I've presented and then Mark and Dr Ross Alexander who's uh, collaborating with us on this project at the university as well. Thank you for your time and I'll answer any questions when we're, when we're able. That was great, Callum. Many thanks. Um, and now we Come to the last speaker this session. Chris Whiteout is based down in down south near in Norwich near John Ennis. He's focused his research on um, plant immunity to diseases, particularly brassicas as well as barley. But he's going to talk in this instance about some his work. He's he's been on reviving Chevalier. So Chris, over to you. Hi. Um... First of all, can you hear me, Luke? Yeah, and can you see my slides? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so first of all, thank you to Robbie and Joanne for the invitation to um, speak to you. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to uh, tell you our little story today. So, um, yes, I work at the John Innes Center uh, as a scientist, but I've also been a, a brewer for, nor for, for uh, nearly 30 years. And when I first started, um, one of my inspirations was this book, Old British Beers and How to Make Them. This is a really interesting little book. Um, it has a select uh, group of uh, recipes in there from the Middle Ages through to the Victorian period. So um, I wanted to make some Victorian beers. Um, and uh, in the introduction to the book, um, Dr. Uh, Harrison talks a little bit about pale malt. And I just want to highlight uh, a few little things here. This is the first mention of uh, Chevalier. Um, so Chevalier was selected by the Reverend Chevalier in the 1820s. Um, and it's a selection, it's, it's not a cross, it's a land race, um, but it was a selection from that land race. And from that, um, it became the premium malting barley almost 100 years. Um, but then he talks about later on, it fell out of fashion as more modern varieties uh, like Sprat Archer and Plumage Archer and, and then Proctor in the 1950s uh, came on stream. Um, and it fell out of fashion basically because there was a, a drive to increase yields. Um, 
to increase extracts to shorten the straw um, so that it was suitable for mechanical harvesting. So by the 1920s, it was more or less uh, obsolete. Now this book got some nice recipes in it. Um, and he, saw, he dwells on this point a little bit. And he says, but actually we cannot obtain malt uh, from pre-1914 barleys. And the cru crucial question is, does it matter? So of course, um, being a scientist and brewer, um, there's a, a challenge you can't resist really. Um, we've, got to, we've got to bring this back and then we can really test whether those recipes from the olden times, um, you know, what did the beer really taste like? So, um, and he concludes in this final bit that I've um, uh, sort of highlighted here, is that on balance we, be use, we believe that using malt made from current grown barleys instead of the old original varieties will have only marginal changes in flavor and quality. So of course we were able to test that and I suppose I can put a spoiler on that and say that actually there is quite a difference um, between these old varieties and, and modern varieties. Okay, so um, just a little, um, a few anecdotes from the past about Chevalier. So widely cultivated for nearly a hundred years. So modern varieties, if they last five years, you're lucky these days. So here, there must have been something good about this um, during that period. And also, if you look at the old literature, you see things like grows well without manure, resistance against drought, fullness of starch, which supports the malting process, and superior quality being more required by maltsters and commanded the highest price. So considering um, the potential opportunities um, with uh, Chevalier and bringing it back uh, into a reality, we registered Chevalier as a conservation variety uh, in 20, 2013 um, under the uh, EU directive. Um, and is, um, Chevalier is now maintained by New Heritage Barley Limited. So we've been working on heritage barley since uh, 2001. Um, we started uh, in 2001 with a public demonstration project. We thought Actually, why don't we um, show people that barley is used to make beer and introduce them to the idea that you can cross barleys to make improved varieties. So we had a little collaboration with the University of Sunderland at Brew Lab. Um, we made some beer, we invited people, we all had a nice time. And uh, that, was, that was kind of our first introduction. We got some old varieties from our seed collection at the John Innes Center, of which there are thousands of barleys. Um, and we selected half a dozen, one of which was Chevalier. Nothing happened for a while, but we did save the seed from that initial um, bulking up, as it were. Uh, and then one day, Keith Thomas from Brew Lab phoned me up and he said, I've got a student called Amal, she's from Iraq, and um, she's interested in a project with heritage barley varieties as uh, sources of disease resistance or other agronomic traits. And this is Amal with Keith, and uh, they're standing by a small plot of Chevalier. Um, she uh, found that actually Chevalier was quite resistant to Fusarium, and that led on to another project, uh, this time at the John Innes Centre, with Rachel Goddard as the PhD student. Um, and she um, looked into more details of the uh, Fusarium resistance that uh, was present in Chevalier. Um, so Rachel is, um, she finished a PhD, she did a few postdocs at the JIC, and now she's a, she's a pathologist at um, Limagran, uh, which is a breeding company, and she works on barley. Um, so uh, that's what she's doing now. Um, <clears throat> and then from 2014, realizing that there was an opportunity here, um, as the sort of the boom in craft brewing started to take off, um, we, uh, went into commercializing uh, heritage varieties. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So um, Chevalier, malting and brewing. We got um, PBSRC grant, uh, it's called follow on funding, which um, the idea is to look at commercial opportunities uh, arising, arising from your research. And this was the work that Rachel had been doing during her PhD. Uh, and this is Rachel here. Um, so I'm just, um, pointer options here, laser pointer. Okay, this is Rachel here, and she's at um, Crisp Maltings, 
and she's turning our first batch of Chevalier malt, which was half a ton. So that was in 2013. It's good that our students get involved with the more hands-on side of uh, research and, and uh, balances out the more academic aspects of doing a PhD. So we were really keen that um, she got involved with, with that aspect. Um, we saved some of the seed from the half ton um, and the following year we had four tons that, that was malted. Um, and then from 2015 onwards, um, batches sufficient for uh, 100 plus tons uh, were malted by Chris Malting Group. So here are the partners in that project. Okay. Um, first of all, it was it was really great to work with with Chris. Um, they had this floor malting, which enabled us to scale uh, quite small batches through to very large uh, batches of malt. Um, so, and, and that was one of the contributing factors to the success um, of, of the project. Um, Keith at uh, Brew Lab, he did um, recipe formulation, flavor, shelf life, uh, and yeast performance. Um, so basically we wanted to know, can you make beer with this? Is it any good? Uh, and a few pointers to um, maybe the kinds of yeast and the effects that it would, would have. And um, this, uh, this is a, a, a brand mark from uh, Chris, um, who also did um, this, um, you know, flavor analysis. And this is, this is a flavor analysis of the, of the malt. So that's um, that's the partnership that enabled us. To... Okay, can I carry on, please? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm at the John Innes Centre, and we do uh, quite fundamental research um, on. Uh, you know, how plants work and my particular specialism on disease resistance and the genetics behind it. Um, but scaling up um, was really not the kind of thing that you want to do in a research organization. So we established a, a startup company uh, called New Heritage Barley. Um, and that is moving, that, that was the particular purpose of, of the company is to scale up to commercial production. So the considerations are that you're starting here like in the germplasm resources unit where there's thousands of different accessions of barley. You see here, for example, small seed packets with just a few seed in there. You can scale that up to one meter plots, up to six meter plots, where you can get some reasonable agronomic um, characteristics. And then you have to scale up then to like 10 hectares. Uh, here, here's a, a seed crop being grown on a, a 10 hectare scale. So you need different machines for different stages of all of that. Um, here you're working with uh, plot combines, which are really nice bits of kit, very, very expensive. Um, but they can give you nice clean samples um, of a few kilos or less. Whereas at this stage, you need a full sized combine harvester um, and you've got to keep the seed clean um, between different batches of barley because you don't want to be getting that uh, mixed up. So you've got to think about the logistics of where you uh, about the seed purity, about how you clean it and dress it. Where are you going to store these different varieties? You know, you're at the ton scale uh, on multi multiple tons of scale. So you need some uh, containers for them uh, so that they clearly differentiated from each other and, and don't get mixed up. And routes to market, and that's where we worked uh, really closely with Crisp and they, 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 they did the marketing for Chevalier. I think the thing is that um, we're, we're working with different stakeholders in the supply chain. We, we realized there was a demand from the brewers for innovation, um, but we also worked with uh, the maltsters and farmers um, and sort of connected them together uh, on this project. And then finally, you get to this kind of stage really, which is where your seed um, is a, a farm scale. Um, and it's quite satisfying to see it coming in from harvest and also breathe a sigh of relief uh, once you've got it in as well. Um, so uh, that's just the vagaries of farming and um, harvest time. So there was a demand from the brewers and here are some examples of some beers that have been made with uh, this uh, Chevalier uh, malt. Um, I think it was quite interesting at the beginning, um, everyone was kind of keen to emphasize the name Chevalier in, in the beer label, see here and here, for example. 
but as time has gone on, they realized that actually um, they're using Chevalet because it has its own distinctive uh, flavors or characteristics. So they don't always highlight it uh, any, you know, they just call it uh, heritage or something like that. And you might find Chevalier written on the on the label on the side, but it's not up front or on the ha on the hand pump. So it's showing you that there are certain characteristics that are desirable for some brewers um, to make their beer. I just want to tell you about my own uh, experiences. So I'm a brewer, um, and um, I got to try Chevalier uh, malt right at the beginning, um, and I this is an IPA that I made with. Um, Chevalier, um, and this is what it looks like in the glass and, and, and from above here, and you can already start to see some uh, features. Uh, it has a, a deep golden color compared to a more modern variety, um, and also it has what's described as mouthfeel, so it has a, has a more full flavor uh, on the palate. And I think linked with that is head retention. So here you see this um, this head that's been formed on the beer, and that will stay with the pint as it goes down, as you drink in, it goes down the glass. And you get these sort of uh, ringlets formed on the side um, that, that uh, make it attractive. You wanna, you wanna see a nice full body pint, um, and uh, it, that, that's the way it looks. Something that we noticed is that it suppresses hot bitterness. And some of these old recipes of the Victorian time had really astonishingly high levels of hops. Um, now, um, it, recreating those um, beers, they don't seem to have the same level of bitterness that we might expect from a more modern malt. There's some kind of chemistry going on there that's suppressing that hot bitterness. We noticed a clear wort. So in brewing, you boil it and you get a hot break. Where the protein precipitates out, um, and I noticed that it, it really forms a really, uh, really good hot break, and you get a nice uh, clear um, uh, drink. There's a slightly lower extract, so this is a, a land race variety. It's older, got higher nitrogen content. The beer, the extract is is lower, um, which is what you might expect. Expect, but it's not hugely lower, um, and you can certainly make you know good beer with it. We did notice that it will affect yeast growth, so you need to do some trials about how your house yeast will perform um, with this different kind of malt. So these other things are things that I've, I've picked up from the literature about how the malt is described, being described as malty, got a honey flavor, orange marmalade, and then you get all weird things from brewers who are really passionate about stuff. And walnut paste on a warm baguette, is, I've had, had it described as that and also an old fashioned uh, kind of flavor. Um, and this kind of reminded me of some like archive uh, photographs from the past of the way beer used to look when you poured it um, in, in the pub there. And there's that nice head that I was talking about there that will stay on that pint as you drink it and, and give a satisfying finish uh, to, the, to the beer. Now, I just wanted to end um, with a couple of science bits. Um, and I draw your attention to this paper here, which was, you know, as scientists, we like to publish in high impact journals and nature plants is pretty good. Um, and uh, it's pretty rare in a nature paper to see um, beer supply mentioned, okay? Um, so um, it sort of uh, made me think a little bit, bit about this and I, I read the paper and, and basically it's about predicting the future climate effects on um, malting barley production. And you can see here that in some of the orange areas on the graph, there's gonna be a reduction um, in the amount of barley grown as a result of climate change. And they converted this into how much increase there's gonna be in the pint, the cost of a pint of beer, okay, in different countries. So um, you can see here, because it's in nature, it's a really important topic. And um, the future of um, barley production is in jeopardy as a result of climate change. But something, a couple of observations that we've made about growing Chevalier over a number of years, um, first of all, is that it performs consistently from year to year. Okay, it doesn't have the high yields of modern varieties, but modern varieties require high inputs. And of course, inputs are getting a lot more expensive over recent years. 
I think for fertilizer is at least 40% more uh, this year. So um, it grows consistently from year to year. And in the drought years of 2018 and last year, um, we still got a, 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 year, a, a consistent yield. And as I just sort of hinted at before on the nitrogen front, um, Chevalier likes low inputs of nitrogen. Um, don't put too much on because it will grow too quickly and it'll, it'll lodge. And not only that, the nitrogen goes to the grain and you get too high, too high a nitrogen content. So um, there, are, there are two things there that we can learn from this land race regarding nitrogen use uh, and also uh, performance during drought. So um, just to summarize about science into practice and reviving Chevalier, um, I think Chevalier and other heritage varieties um, are able to provide disease resistance and sustainability traits. Um, I talked a bit about scaling up and how we involve all industries in the supply chain in order to achieve that. Um, heritage malts um, may provide some unique processing flavor and sensory attributes. And that there is a demand for uh, these varieties. Um, new beers are being made from them and customers want to buy them. So that's, that's our story. Um, and quite a number of people have been involved in this project um, to enable its success. I would particularly like to mention today Bob King and Dave Griggs, who were fully supportive of this right from the start. Um, Keith and Amal um, for that initial work. Lars, um, he's at PBL Plant um, uh, Bioscience Limited. So that is to do with uh, intellectual property and, and such like. Um, at the John Innes Center. David Jones at Morley Farms, who has been great in helping us get this going. Richard Dalton from Grettenhall Farm and Workhouse. So um, I'll show a picture on the next slide about that. Um, particular thanks to Sarah at New Heritage Barley um, for um, you know, helping getting this uh, talk together. Also at the John Innes, Paul, Rachel, Andy, Mike and Kathy, who are really supportive and all the craft brewers who have helped. Funding wise, um, Sarah got uh, funding from the Royal Society of Edinburgh Enterprise Fellowship um, to uh, start the company. Um, and also we got some funding from BBSRC as a follow on funding project. Um, we also, I, I haven't talked about it today, but we also had some partnering awards with the United States and Canada. And I haven't talked about that work today, but I noticed that um, Ashley McFarlane and Mark Sorrells are in the audience today. So hello, Ashley, and hello, Mark. Um, we, we can talk about uh, our project another time. So um, that's all I have to say today. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I just want to end with this slide about uh, the little bit of work we did at Gresson Hall Farm and Workhouse, where we grew some Chevalier and harvested it in the traditional way. And this is Richard Dalton on a traditional um, harvesting um, machine with two very nice Suffolk punches. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the talk and thanks for giving us all a bit of a thirst. That was great. Um, we're running home for time slightly, so questions are, are going to be slightly curtailed, but uh, I think Robbie wanted to say something before we got going on the, on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Luke. Just quickly, I just wanted to remind people that um, this conference is coming up. Can you see that on your screens? Um, it's the third Barley Mutant Conference that's taking place in uh, Okayama University in Kurashiki in Japan. It's on October the 8th to the 10th this year. And if you if you Google this, you'll find it on, on the web clearly. So just to remind people that this is coming up um, at, towards the end of this year. So. That's all. Over to the questions. Okay, I'll just rattle through some of the questions in the chat, given the time. Um, there's a couple of questions to Susan, mostly focusing on just the amount of beer people were drinking. Was the what was the uh, what was the negative effects of that? Just was it historically noted? Of, uh... Well, actually, it's kind of the opposite. First, I mean, people think that beer is really good for your health, which is why they're drinking it because it's very good in humoral terms and it's, it balances your humours and it's better than drinking water and so on. Um, but there are a lot of complaints in the 16th century about 
um, tippling or drinking all day. So it's it's not what you drink or how much, it's how you drink. So if you're drinking for work, that's acceptable. But if you're drinking the pub all day or wasting money, the Protestant ethic is very much against that. So um, yeah, so it's not, there are, I don't think there's like extra reports of accidents or, you know, drunken brawls because people were drinking so much, which is interesting in itself. Um, so maybe that speaks to different process of metabolism or something in this in this period, which is what we're, we're interested in, really. Thanks. Then some other questions actually to Joanne about the um, manganese response of a bit, whether there's how much you know on the on the differential is it uptake or, or um, partition, whatever. Um, we do know a little bit about that, and I, I don't think Tim's online today, but he could explain it a bit better. But we know that um, certainly the soil, the Bury soil is actually the available, available manganese is very low. So we assume that um, what it what the bear does take up, it uses very efficiently. So compared to obviously the the um, the modern varieties. Again, the same for most of the the soil on on Bury. When it when we compare it to the soils um, on on Orkney up by the college, it's actually the the available phosphorus and the available potassium, and mag, um, magnesium are all are all much lower. Although there's more available copper, so it's you know there's um there's definitely some um you know in the what the mechanism is we can only hypothesize. There was also a quick question from Robbie about the differentiation between the bears from Orkney relative to Shetland and the Western Isles. Um, are there other unique characteristics associated with, say, say bears from the Western Isles compared to Orkney? That we, I mean, they're they're genetically different. We, I mean, we haven't really. We would need to grow them all on these different places, which you know, some we would really like to do if we can find somewhere to grow them on Shetland and somewhere to grow them on some of the Western Isles, it would be really good. In fact, we've got a participatory breeding um, approach going on, but um, on the small scale. So maybe one day we'll be able to scale that up to more field um, trials. So at the moment, we don't know. OK, uh, Callum, I've got a question from Robbie about um, whether you or anyone had molted uh, some of the deep, highly deeply coloured uh, barley grains you had on on your on your slides with potentially um, different phenolic compounds. Whether that you had the chance to make spirit from so many of these land races, and whether the flavour profiles were were significantly different. Good question. Uh, yes, we've malted them. No, we haven't measured the uh, the phenolic compounds. So that's definitely something of interest. But I guess um, there there is a proof of concept there in that. Again, from, from our work with roasted malts, we do see some evidence uh, around barley being able to con contribute sort of appreciable amounts of phenolic, sort of smoky type aromas that you would you would traditionally get from peat into a spirit. So uh, definitely of uh, definitely of interest, yes. And you've also got a question from Steve Holt uh, about whether you've Again, coming from your, your slides, whether you have a chance to um, separate out the, the aroma taste effects, of both the cultivar and site season effects in your new, yeah. in your mature. Um, so around cultivar and variety, yes, we'll definitely be looking at, at, at that. That'd be a, a core component of the, the project and, and, um, and aroma. So certainly I think part, initial, initial part of the project will be trying to maybe get a little bit more detail around the more subtle malt aromas. I think some of the more bulky aromas we're, we're quite familiar with, but the likelihood is with a lot of these barleys, the differences will be a little bit more delicate. So we need to identify some of those differences in, in the first instance, but then um, certainly around the impact on the the typical complement of, of aromas. Yes, we will do that quite quickly. Around um, so the impact on, on site and, and environmental conditions that we'd certainly like to look at. But again, it's about finding uh, finding suitable uh, suitable space and, and time to grow them. So if anyone wants to, to collaborate there, I'm, I'm, my, my email is on my slides. OK, and maybe a final question to Chris from Julian South. Uh, would you have a recommended hop variety to go with Chevalier Malt to give you uh, a traditional? Fuddles or Fuddles? Ah. That was short and sweet. Given the time, I think we 
need to wrap up there. There's a few extra questions in the chat. If anyone's really interested, please email the, the, the contributors directly. I just wish to thank all four contributors again. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it was a really nice and interesting um, presentation and hopefully see you all again in a couple of weeks. Cheers.